Mexico were killed. And the army come very angry and said, Alright, let's teach them lesson by the Italians who hold these things. والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض We begin today's third day of our international Islamic retreat the second international Islamic retreat taking place here in beautiful Simon's Town in Cape Town in South Africa. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him and we thank Him for the lovely sunshine that has come back again today. We pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My teacher of blessed memory Mawlana Dr. Fadl Rahman Ansari, who was Ali Muhammad's teacher, Muhammad Ali Khan's teacher. He trained us to be critical students and critical thinkers. He didn't want gramophone records around him. He didn't want students who would uncritically absorb everything he taught. No, this was a different method. And so I, I was trained never to accept anything that was taught to me, even by my teacher, unless I was convinced that it was correct. And I'd be disappointed in you if you do not also follow that path. Not only should you critically accept, assess everything that is taught by me, but by all the others as well. And if you are not con convinced, do not accept it. So I would go to him, of course very politely, and I would say to him, Molana, I don't agree. I never disrespected him. <coughs> I never defied him. I never attempted to talk a box and go to box with him. No, that is disastrous for the pursuit of knowledge. You have to learn humility. So I would say to him very humbly, Molana, I don't agree with you. And I would survive, eh? I would survive. But three months later, I'd go to him and say, Molana, now I agree with you because I was battling all those months to understand and today you're going to get a taste of that. And he would stand up in the classroom sometimes and he would say, I'm proud of Imran because when I am dead and gone he's not going to be a gramophone record. <laughs> no. He would have critically assessed whatever I had taught. And when he was convinced, he would accept it. And when he then teaches it, when I am no longer in the world, it will be his thought coming out of him. Hmm? And now that he is in his grave, up to now I still differ with him on certain issues. But I cherish the very trust on which he walked. That's not contradictory. No. Secondly, he never attempted to program any teacher who was teaching in our his institute. No. The teachers came and they had their own freedom and their own individuality. And some of them might teach views which were different from his. So what? He didn't have to cross-examine every teacher. And only when he was he was he found it acceptable, would he appoint him? No. And so there were Deobandi teachers on the staff. There were Brelvi teachers on the staff, but he tell them, teach the subject as a sign to you. So in this retreat, you're being exposed to so many <coughs> teachers. And if you are uncomfortable, 
if you are not convinced, simply do not accept it. But that is no reason for picking up boxing gloves. Now, the subject that we have to address today is not an easy one. No. And you would eventually find it to be one that Allah Himself recognizes to be of absolutely strategic importance. Methodology. We've talked about, do you remember, bow down to Adam? And then we talked about that the Quran is the only absolutely authentic source for us. And the Quran sits in judgment over the Hadith, not vice versa. And that if there is even the appearance of a conflict between what is stated in the Qur'an and something in the Hadith, we stay with the Qur'an until the contradiction is resolved, if ever. Hmm? We looked also briefly again in the Usul al-Tafsir at the theory of abrogation, cancellation. And now today we expand on methodology. Incrementally you're getting it. In Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> provokes us to think. Surely the first house of worship, which was established for the sake of mankind to worship, is that one which was established in Bakka with a B. Blessed Bakka. And it was established that guidance may reach mankind. But elsewhere in the Qur'an, he uses the word Mecca. But here, for the first time and the only time, he uses the word Mecca. Nothing happens in the Qur'an by accident. No. And so we are now provoked to think and to inquire, why Mecca? You cannot answer that question unless you leave the Qur'an and you go outside the Qur'an because the answer is outside. Sometimes the answers are to be found in scriptures which came before and sometimes the answers are to be found in the historical process. It's outside of the Qur'an. So you've got homework to do. The answer which we arrive at when we do our homework outside of the Qur'an, outside of the Hadith, hmm? Qur'an and Hadith, is that they did a hatchet job on the Torah in order to make it impossible for Banu Israel to accept Muhammad as the Prophet of Allah. Why? If he is a prophet and we recognize him as a prophet, we go have a big problem. What's the problem? The implication would be that our book is filled with lies. And so they cannot accept him as a prophet. Because they're holding on to a book filled with lies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses only one word, one single word, to direct attention to that whole web of lies. One word was enough. Ismail alayhi salam is the one chosen from whom Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu would come. 
from Ishaq alayhi salam many, 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 many came. So in order to make it impossible for them to accept the one who is to come from Ismail alayhi salam, you have to do a lot of things. <coughs> you have to remove from the Torah any evidence that Ibrahim alayhi salam ever went to Arabia. You have to remove from the Torah any evidence that he built a house of Allah in Arabia. You have to remove from the Torah any evidence that he established the pilgrimage to that house, the Hajj. The child of the sacrifice can no longer be Ismail alayhi salam. You got to do a hatchet job and make it Ishaq instead of Ismail alayhi salam. Hmm? And the angel had rubbed his heel on the sand and then the water came out and the angel then disappeared and she ran and she built with her hands a bank around the water. Thousands of years later, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam would say, May Allah bless our mother Hajar. If she had not done that, Zamzam would have been a river. But because she did that, Zamzam became a spring. It's still there up to now. But they can't recognize that. So they replace Arabia with Palestine. They said that he took Hajar and the baby to a place in Palestine and the well was there in that place in Palestine. But somehow or the other in the process of rewriting the Torah the old name Bakka Somehow or the other managed to escape the, the axe. Or maybe that Allah caused them to forget. And the name Bakka was retained, that the well was in the valley of Bakka. Now Bakka is a Shadda. So if you read it without the Shadda, it becomes Bakka. And in the Torah to this day, the word Bakka, instead of Bakka, is still there. This is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran returns to the old name of Bakka. Here is our explanation. If you have a better explanation, please let us know. <laughs> But you cannot come to this understanding of the use of the word Bakka in the Qur'an without this additional methodology of going outside of the Qur'an in order to understand the Qur'an. Going outside of the Hadith in order to understand the Qur'an and Hadith. With this additional me methodology we can now begin our study of the subject of riba. The Prophet said والسلام, that the age of Dajjal will be the age of Kathra to Riba. You find the text of the Hadith in my book, The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. You know Dajjal. We've been talking about him. He is someone created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, programmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's essentially an evil being. Can Allah create evil? Kul, a'udhu bi rabbil falak. What comes after that? Min sharri ma khalaq. Yes, Allah can create evil. And he can create evil, number one, to test, and number two, to punish. So he's an evil being. And he was created, among other things, to function as someone who would seek to impersonate the true Messiah. They rejected him. They said, no, you cannot be the Messiah. You are bas bastard. Not only that, but look at you. You are dead. 
you crucify. And the book says that he, whosoever dies like that is the curse of Allah, it's Deuteronomy. Hence, beyond any shadow of a doubt, you could not have been the Messiah. And then they boasted of it. Of course, you know what they did not know. He did not die. He's coming back. But they don't accept that. So Allah created this being and programmed him to impersonate the Messiah. And since the Messiah is to rule the world, this is implicit in the hadith that he would be Hakim. Hakim. Since he is to rule the world with a rule which cannot be rivaled by any other rule, that's a ruling state. The Jal must also attempt to rule the world, impose his rule over the whole world. And only after he has done that can he declare from Jerusalem, I am the Messiah. And all the one-eyed will accept him. Hmm? It is only then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send back the true Messiah who will kill the false Messiah. This is so close now that children at school should live to see it. That's how close it is. How is he going to achieve this goal of ruling the world? That's not easy. No one has ever done it. Except Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam who made a dua to Allah, give me a state give me a rule which cannot be rivaled in history by any other. In the hadith of Sahih Muslim, we learned about the island. Since you're all familiar, you've all looked at it already, we can move rapidly. That when he's released in a day like a year, which is stage one of his mission, it would be from that island that he would seek to achieve his goal of ruling the world from Jerusalem. And then he moved to stage two, which was a day like a month, and stage three, a day like a week. Since we have identified that he is going to be on an island, we had to ask the question, which island was it? And they were so keen to tell me in Singapore, it's Singapore! <laughs> <laughs> because they told me Singapore is little Israel. <laughs> we have to identify the island, which island is it? We know, number one, that it is about one month's journey from the Arab world by sea. We know, number two, that it is an island with expertise in spying and espionage. We know, number three, that it is an island which conceals its true identity because so much hair on the body of that beast, you could not tell which side was head and which side was tail. Okay, you remember that? <coughs> we know, number four, that it is an island in which religion will eventually crumble, crumble because the monastery is lying in ruins. So we would expect that one day in that island, churches are going to be sold to become bingo halls and restaurants. Huh? And of course, you know Muslims, <laughs> they become a mustard. Which island is it? You can hear them, you can see them shaking their heads now, those who came from Britain. <laughs> you can see them shaking their heads now. 
This is where we have to go out of the Quran and out of the Hadith and do our homework. This is part of methodology. It is not only that the Quran explains itself, but more than that, you have to go outside of the Quran to understand the Quran. We see Britain with a mysterious relationship with the Holy Land. 1916. How come Britain enters into a treaty with Ibn Saud? We still have the text of the treaty up to this day. Britain and Ibn Saud, who is still in a place called Riyadh, which had a few camels, that's all, nothing else. <laughs> and then in 90, and of course, a fellow called Lawrence of Arabia is at work. And of course, he must have his checkbook. And then in 1917, a British army defeats the Ottoman Islamic Empire uh, army and uh, General Allenby enters into Jerusalem and declares today <coughs> the Crusades are over. Of course he was wrong, the Crusades are still going on. And then from 1918 to 1948 Britain rules over the Holy Land as the mandate power a mandate conferred by the League of Nations. You notice I'm speaking a little slower today? Because I have enough time today. <laughs> and then in 1948, Britain functions as a midwife for the baby to be born. And since 1948, Britain continues to maintain her mysterious relationship with the Holy Land, the last one being a fellow, I don't know whether you've heard about, about him, he was looking for a job the other day, his name was Tony Blair. <laughs> <laughs> this led us to the conclusion that the island is Britain. But you don't have to accept our conclusion. No. Anyone is free to withhold acceptance. But if you say that we are wrong and you want us to treat you seriously, then you must tell us what is right. And you must give us the evidence which supports your conclusion. Good. We notice that for the first time in modern history, a ruling state emerged, Britain. And the, 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 the title that was used, this is Ambassador Adrian Rose's subject now, the title that was used to describe that ruling state and the rule over the world was in Roman, I'm uh, sorry, in Latin, called Pax Britannica. But when they taught us this subject in the classrooms of international politics, they didn't have the Bible with them, they didn't have the Quran with them. <laughs> so they were unable to locate the emergence of Pax Britannica in any larger framework as part of a greater whole. We noticed that Pax Britannica, or Britain's rule over the world, was not possible without something connected with money. Britain became the money lender of the world. Money lending in Europe was not possible. No. It was frowned upon. The Christian church rejected it. I have often referred to a book which was published in 1935 by a man named R. W. Tawney. Come on, Masabo, let's hear what's the name of the book. MashaAllah, that's good. That's good. The British flag is flying here today. <laughs> Religion and the rise of capitalism. 
<laughs> by R. W. Tony, 1935. You're going to have to go on the internet for that. And in that book, this scholar meticulously records the strong opposition of Christian Europe, including Britain, to usury, to borrowing and lending money on interest. But something broke the back of Christendom, called the French Revolution. And after the French Revolution, the, the economy based on riba now emerged in Europe for the first time. Just about that time, something happened in Britain. And that was the birth of the Bank of England. And the Bank of England started this nonsense about printing paper. And you could come back with your paper and redeem your money. Because your paper was a promissory note. <clears throat> Except that sometimes when you came back, the bank wouldn't have enough money to pay you, so then it busted. <laughs> busted. So this is not a, a, a new phenomenon. It was happening since then. I think shortly after the Bank of East, in Britain, England was established, maybe three, four, five years later, the first bus took place. Lots of people lost their money. Britain was involved in riba both as a money lender and also the other form of riba, namely the monetary system of what you're going to use as money, paper as money. And Britain became fabulously wealthy. <coughs> the, the scientific and technological revolution also gave to Britain military power that was unprecedented in the world. And there is a reference to that scientific and technological revolution in the donkey that flies. Aeronautical engineering. We have an engineer here with us. He said that the earth would deliver its treasures to the child. Again, the scientific and technological revolution explains it. But when that big diamond was discovered in southern Africa in the late 19th century, they rushed to South Africa, southern Africa. And then they started the mining. And if you go to Kimberley, you'll see. It's something called a diamond vein. A diamond vein. They use the word vein way down in the bowel of the earth. You've got to <coughs> dig a hole big enough to put about five jumbo jets into that hole. And at the bottom of that hole, way down there, they reached the right diamond vein. And they mined it, and at the side of the Kimberley big hole, there are wheelbarrows with plastic nuggets, piled up with plastic nuggets to show you how many diamonds came out of that big, big hole. Just these five wheelbarrows. That was the earth delivering its treasures to Dajan. Why? Because of the scientific and technological revolution which is still continuing. continuing. And they use every hook and every satanic crook using an Englishman named Cecil John Rhodes. Sorry, I mean, sorry to mention it's an Englishman. To take fraudulent control over that treasure, giving the black African people alcohol as wages and so on. Paying the wage laborers who were digging the hole in paper. You could only you could only redeem that paper with us. So it was a rip-off. They were exploited. And all those diamonds were shipped to Europe to the mastermind who was in charge of it, the Rothschilds. And by nineteen 
16, sorry, 1914, they had amassed a sufficient amount of wealth in Europe to be able to finance a big war. You know, financing a big war and really making money means you must pay both sides. <laughs> you have to finance both sides of the war. And so they closed down Kimberley in the summer of 1914. And they started the First World War in the summer of 1914, which led to the demise of Britain as a superpower, but gave them the Holy Land. Between the First World War and the Second World War, we saw the evidence accumulating that Britain was going down. And the last nail in the coffin, the last nail in the coffin was in 1956. Egypt, keep quiet now. 1956. What happened in 1956? Yes. Jamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. And then Britain, France, and Israel retaliated by sending their troops and reoccupying the canal. Hmm? A general in Washington surprised the world a man named Dwight Eisenhower. He didn't surprise the world because he was morally indignant about what they had done and he supported the just cause of the Arabs and blah, 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 as they say in Cape Town. <laughs> no! He ordered he ordered Britain to withdraw and ordered France to withdraw. Why? Because a day like a year has come to an end and a day like a month has now begun. That's why you have to withdraw. And so Britain had to, the British lion had to put his tail between its legs and withdraw, and the British Prime Minister, whose name was Churchill. Churchill. You're guessing, that's a PhD in guessing. <laughs> the British Prime Minister was? Anthony Eden. Had to resign. The British government fell. In 1963, another event took place, which was to demonstrate to the world that a new ruling state has emerged. The evidence, of course, was already there before 1963, but in 1963 we had to confirm to the world in a very dramatic way. We are the rulers of the world. What happened in 1963? The Cuban Missile Crisis. That Khrushchev, this Russian Premier, was placing nuclear missiles on Cuban territory in retaliation for NATO placing nuclear missiles in Turkish territory, threatening Europe. So John Kennedy imposed unilaterally what he called the quarantine which had no justification in international law, around Cuba. And the Cuban ships which were coming on the way would now have to decide whether they're going to 
bust the quarantine and the world will now be engulfed in nuclear warfare or whether there could be a resolution to the problem. The problem was resolved, yes. The ships turned back and went back home and the missiles were removed from Cuba. And the world said, whoa, wow, this is really great. Your Uncle Sam rules the world now. What they didn't tell us was that the United States had made a deal with Russia. If you remove your missiles from Cuba, we will remove our missiles from Turkey. And since that deal was struck, they cannot attack Turkey, I mean, uh, Russia, I mean, uh, Cuba. So Fidel Castro is still there, very comfortable in Cuba because of that deal of 1963. The United States now replaces Britain as the new ruling state in the world. And when Britain, as the ruling state, ruled the seas, every single important naval port on the face of the earth was under British control. Now the donkey takes over, <laughs> the flying donkey takes over and the United States imposes or places U.S. bases which have of course a Navy complement but aircraft carriers and Air Force and they are scattered all over the world. I don't know whether there is a U.S base in South Africa. Diego Garcia. No, no, Botswana. Botswana. In Botswana. Mm -hmm. There was one in Libya. And Jamal Abdel Nasser should have known about it. There was one in Libya. Need to be in Botswana. And in 1967, when the Egyptian Air Force was expecting the attack to come from the east, it never came from the east. It came from the west. Because the aircraft took off from the Wheeler Air Force Base, the American Air Force Base in Libya, and destroyed the entire Egyptian Air Force on the ground at the beginning of the war. Hmm? The United States takes over as a new ruling state in the world and controls the air. It controls the air. In addition to the sea. The air. And American troops are all over the world, all over the world. But the United States does not depend on military power alone to rule the world. The United States takes over from Britain as the financial capital of the world. And the banking system reaches its zenith at this time. And the United States becomes the money lender of the world, with Europe behind it and Britain behind it. And the British sterling pound is replaced by the US dollar as the new international currency. And uh, this is your homework now. You have to go back home and go and check out and find the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944 in upstate New York at a place called Bretton Woods. And you've got to read the proceedings of the conference. You come across the name John Maynard Keynes. They don't teach this in the Darul. And you come across the name White, I think it was Richard White or something like that, the American delegate. Hmm? And the debates that were taking place in that conference and the decision what to do with the world of paper money. We have successfully driven the gold, dinar and silver dirham out of the market. We have done it already during the process of colonization. We have introduced the paper during the process of colonization and we are now ready to decolonize. This is 1944. 
Pakistan has not yet come into being, India has not yet come into being. But okay. before we start handing out these bits of paper called independence and then ruling them by proxy, we have to put institutions in place. Hmm? And so from that Bretton Woods conference, which we had to study as students, emerge a plan for only one currency to have linked with gold, the U.S. dollar. It would still be redeemable in gold, so we can throw some dust in their eyes. Hmm? And the U.S. dollar would be redeemable at the rate of 35 U.S. dollars to one ounce of gold. But only one currency can be redeemed for gold. All the rest of the paper currencies of the world, all the rest of them, will have value only in relation to the U.S. dollar. A first-year student in Darul Uloom, he doesn't have to become a mufti, would look at that and say, this is 99% haram. 99% haram. And this is 1944. Where were the scholars of Islam in 1944? And then secondly, they said, yes, this one currency will still have redeemability, meaning you could bring the paper and get the gold at the rate of 35 for one ounce of gold. But only governments can do that. Only central banks can do that. The people who are using the money for buying and selling, they can't do it. So the first year student in the Darul will now say this is 99.99% haram. That's the first year student. So where his teachers? <laughs> where the muftis? 1944. And where have they been since 1944? So the United States starts off with an advantage, a tremendous advantage, built in into the Bretton Woods Accord. And so the International Monetary Fund is created. And in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, there is an article that Dr. Muhammad Mahathir was not aware of, the Prime Minister of Malaysia. <laughs> that the International Monetary Fund Articles of Agreement prohibit the, prohibit the use of gold as money. Yeah. That includes the gold in our, that's on the money. Where were the scholars of Islam? In 1945, when the International Monetary Fund emerged, where were they? And where have they been since then? In 1971, Charles de Gaulle, who was not a particularly good friend of America, of course they were very pleased when John Kennedy was married to a French girl, Jacqueline de Beauvoir, became Jacqueline Kennedy. So you have a French girl in the White House. Yeah. But Charles de Gaulle could see that this system was unfair and he was a French nationalist and he felt it was unfair to France. And when he saw the United States printing and printing and printing paper to finance the Vietnam War in the late 60s, in September of 1971, Charles de Gaulle did something dramatic. And with that, the game was over. He knocked on the door of Washington. He says, hello, are you there? <laughs> so they opened the door. He says, I'm Charles de Gaulle. And I'm not just a simple person in the market. I'm a government. I'm a central bank. And I have in me in my pocket three billion U.S. Paperbacks, greenbacks, U.S. dollars, and I want the gold. Could you kindly give me the gold? <laughs> the game was up. 
because this was never contracted with any intention to be faithfully adhered to. Oh no, this was just dust in their eyes. So Richard Nixon retired to a place called Camp David. They normally do that. And spend the weekend probably drinking whiskey. And on Sunday, before the markets opened on Monday, declared, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it, you dum-dum. <laughs> <laughs> That's international relations. The finest product of modern Western civilization is you give your word, but you don't have to keep it. Part of the tradition, you know, the three levels of lies, you have lies, you have great lies, and you've got 9-11. <coughs> so, he said that the United States will not honor its obligation, its contractual obligation under international law. A contractual obligation under international law. He will not honor it, they take it up and they throw it to pieces. So then what's going to happen? Nothing. Since 1971, the United States just simply bought some more printing machines and bought some more ink and kept on printing more and more and more and more. So long as those dum-dums won the U.S. dollar, we just print it for them. Yeah. You think Europe did not understand what Charles de Gaulle did? Do you think Europe did not understand how unfair the system was? Giving this advantage to the United States as the ruling state in the world, that's the role that money played. They understood it perfectly, but they did nothing about it. No. They spoke about it, but they did nothing about it, because they could do nothing about it. It's only when the moment comes in the historical process, when a day like a month comes to an end, or is coming to an end, only then would you see the controlled incremental demolition of the U.S. dollar. It's not happening by accident. No. This by design. <laughs> because a day like a month is now coming to an end and uh, the process of moving from stage to stage was one in which riba has played a central role they don't teach the subject of riba this way no one teaches the subject of riba this way no and of course now that a day like a week is about to commence a new ruling state has to emerge. The last of three, listen to the word, three messianic, from messiah, messiah, three messianic ruling states. The first Pax America, Pax Britannica, the second Pax Americana. This terminology is used by all diplomats, by all people in international affairs, strategic affairs, but they never delve, delve beneath the language to try to understand a bigger picture. And now a third ruling state is like, it has to emerge. And we say, and we've been saying it for 15 years now, and nobody seems to be hearing amongst the ulama. I don't know, they're very busy. Let it be guarded in my language, eh, because it's important scolded me. But hello, I remember. Mm. We say it is Pax Judaica. We say it is Pax Judaica that is coming. Is Imran Hussein a prophet? Does he have angels coming and talk to him? Does he have a jinn who is informing him? No, you dumb dumb. This is political analysis based on the Quran and the Hadith. It is so frustrating. 
they would not do the homework to study this subject and then they ask is he a prophet mm -hmm. a third ruling state has to emerge we are standing on the doorstep of that now Israel already rules the United States and the United States knows that everybody knows that Israel controls the what we call Parliament they call it the House of the Congress the rest of the world calls it Parliament the Congress is comprised of two houses one is the House of Representatives and the other is the Senate these two combined are called the Congress the US Congress in other countries they call it the Parliament and the United States Congress is controlled by the Zionists on behalf of Israel. It's an open secret. So if Israel controls the ruling state in the world, <coughs> is it far-fetched to say that Israel would eventually replace the United States as a ruling state in the world? Huh? But if Israel is to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world, it's not only with a dazzling display of military power, with that is a part of the subject, but not for today. We're more concerned with the part concerning money. Israel will not only have to continue where the United States left off as a money lender of the world, and as the ruling currency in the world but since the objective is to rule the world you have to do more than simply rip them off hmm? you have to be able to enslave them and so you have to find a means of imposing financial slavery if you refuse to bow, you'll be a slave. If you're willing to cooperate with me and fly to Washington and fly to Jerusalem as the blue-eyed boy who used to be your foreign minister once upon a time, and then he ended in jail. <laughs> We're going to be on good terms with you. We could be on good terms with you, we'll be on the gravy train. The Prophet said so, that Dajjal will come to a people and they would follow him. And he'd call the rain, cause the rain to fall. And their crops will grow. And the cattle will come back home in the evening with their humps filled high. The people will prosper. That's why Singapore is prospering. And then the child will come to another people and they would resist him. And he will stop the rain from falling. And the crops will not grow. And the cattle will come back home in the evening after grazing all day, lean and thin. Hmm? That's poverty, that's destitution, that's Egypt. That's Egypt. Egypt is resisting. Egyptians are resist resisting. Hmm? And so, in the third stage of the process, the control over money has to perform a function more than simply impoverishing people. In the third stage, you have to bring financial slavery upon people. And so, Pax Judaica has a monetary component to it. The military one is a separate one. And we have said that it is money that you cannot see, money that you cannot touch. Huh? Who is going to accept money that he cannot see? Who is going to accept money that he cannot touch except someone who has the intellectual acumen of a donkey? Huh? But that's what's coming. It's electronic money, but they have a knack for finding nice words. 
to cover up the poison. So they took the word homosexuality, they gave it a shower, they put some perfume on it, and they transformed it into gay. <laughs> They took the word money lender, they gave it a shower, they put some perfume onto it, and they call it banker. <laughs> and so now, welcome to the cashless world. It sounds nice, sounds exciting. And all those dum dums are getting hooked onto it. A cashless world. My gosh, this is progress. And so the slaves buy their own slavery. <laughs> this is the ultimate success of all. Where you give your enemy a piece of rope, you teach him how to tie the knot. You give him a chair, you get him to tie the rope onto the Oh, the tree. You tell him, stand up there. And you get him to put the rope around his own neck. And then you tell him, step. Step out. And when he steps out and he finds himself now being choking to death, oh my gosh, this is what you did to me? <laughs> is that our state today? Is that the state of the scholars of Islam today? How many are they around the world today? How many are they who are ringing the bell, alarm bell? Mankind, mankind, or Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, watch it. This is the ultimate instrument of slavery. Do you know their names amongst the scholars of Islam? It was the Farewell pilgrimage. And Nabi Muhammad went in on Arafah, gave the khutbah. And at the end of the khutbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation. Al yawm, akmantu lakum deenakum, wa atmantu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al Islam adina. This day have I perfected for you. Your deen. Completed my favor unto you. And I have ordained for you Islam as your deen. So we thought this was the end. Nothing more after this. Finish. Finish. And now we return to Medina. And there are only about 81 days left in the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And now revelation comes down. Yes, the last revelation was not that one. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and recorded in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, this is the last revelation. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqallaha wa dharu ma baqiya mina riba in kuntu mu'mineen. O you who have faith in Allah, fear Allah, and give up what remains of your demand for riba in kuntum mu'min, if you are indeed a people of faith. And if you don't do it, then take notice of a declaration of war from Allah and His Messenger. Huh? This is the harshest language that you'll find in the Quran. Most people don't have time for the Quran. So sad. And this is the last revelation. Why would Allah choose to send one more revelation after saying the job is finished? Why? It is to provoke you to think and to give you the mother of all warning that here lies the most deadliest poison of all. If this poison were to be injected into the body of the Ummah, you'd be paralyzed. And they would enslave you. 
And yet, the poison came. The paralysis has come upon us. And still we are not teaching the subject of riba to the people. The first revelation came down something like six or seven years after revelation started with Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. It is in Surah Al-Rum. And the, the revelation confines itself to educating us. وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ رِبًا لِيَرْبُوَ فِي أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ فَلَا يَرْبُوَ عِنَّ اللَّهِ وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ زَكَاةٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُدْعِفُونَ What you put out as riba so that your wealth might increase in the wealth of others will not increase with Allah. But what you put out as charity Seeking Allah's faith, Allah's pleasure. Ah, that will increase, increase many, many times. With Allah, this is the first reference to riba in the Quran. So, we want to know, what is the lesson being taught here? Obviously, it's a contrast between riba and charity. And, uh, we want to know, well then, how does a contrast between riba and charity teach us about what is riba? Hmm? So we went to all the tafasir. I was in New York, could <coughs> find an answer. I kept on driving around New York for about four or five months asking myself, what is the message? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offering a contrast between riba and charity? The one tafsir which had the answer and which was in my home for some mysterious reason, I never looked at it. It seems as though the angels did it that way, so I wouldn't look at it. Huh? After about four or five months in New York, this was around 1992, 1993. Were you born at that time? I then got the message. If you plant, one day you reap. And I was planting for four or five months until eventually it came like a flash, not through the logical process. I had done my homework at the logical process, the rational process. The answer came as a flash. <laughs> what is a perfect act of charity? It is to give and take nothing in return. Well, that will help you, Imran, to understand what's a perfect act of riba. It is to take and give nothing in return. I was astonished. If they're only taking and giving nothing in return, what's going to happen to Africa one day? What's going to happen to Bangladesh? What's going to happen to Pakistan? What's going to happen to Indonesia? If they're only taking and giving nothing in return. It's a rip-off. But the Quran did not go beyond this contrast that was offered. It's a process of education. And Ambassador Adlan Rose was trying to tell them in Malaysia, in Pass, the ulama, <laughs> tell him, telling them, you have to go stage by stage, you have to approach the subject incrementally, you cannot just come and impose a sharia. He was telling them that. 
And then came the second revelation. Uh, and now we're no longer in Mecca. We're in Medina. <coughs> and there's a large community of Jews in Medina. And they are lending money and interest. And we are warned by Abdullah bin Salam. Remember he's a rabbi who became Muslim. Warned. You are now in Medina. If a man gives you, if you lend money on interest, sorry, sorry, if you give a man a loan and he offers you a meal, don't eat it. Because that's riba. Unless he used to offer you a loan before, sorry, unless he used to offer you a meal before you gave him the loan. In which case you can eat it. Let me repeat the hadith. If you give a man a loan and he offers you a meal after that, don't eat it because that's riba. Unless he used to offer you a meal before you gave him the loan, in which case you can eat it. If you give a man a loan and he offers you a ride on his donkey or his BMW, don't take it because that's riba. Unless he used to offer you a ride on his donkey before you gave him the loan, in which case you can take it. In other words, it doesn't matter whether the rate of interest is big or small, it is still riba. And the Prophet told us, even if the rate of interest is small, the riba is small, it will still result in the same end of poverty and destitution. It just take a little more time. But we are now in Medina, and the process of education also continues in the Quran. Not just with the Prophet ﷺ, not just with Abdullah ibn Salam. They argue, because they are money lenders, eh? and we are now in Medina, and we are saying, oh, hey, 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 you are taking and you are giving nothing in return. This is not like charity, this is the opposite of charity. So they have to defend themselves. So the money lenders in Marina are defending themselves by saying, this is business. This is business. Shylock is speaking. This is business. So Allah responds now with stage, stage one continuing of education. He gives a second contrast. The second contrast is between riba and business. The first is between riba and charity. He says, Ahallallahu al-bay'a wa harram al-riba. Allah has made business halal and He has made riba haram. Well, we've got homework here to do. Yes. If business is halal and riba is haram, well then, why the contrast? What is the message? I want to know. <coughs> you got homework to do to understand the Quran. He reveals the Quran in such a way that you have to do homework to understand it. What is a, a, a business transaction in order for it to qualify as a business transaction? You have to come in the market to do business. The market is a place where you could make a profit or you could suffer a loss. That's business. Huh? You embrace something called risk. And when you embrace risk, then Ad-Razak can take and give. One day for me, one day for you. So it's not the function of the government of Malaysia to redistribute wealth. Huh? 
is what they call the Bhumiputra policy. No. <laughs> when you attempt to redistribute wealth, you corrupt the market. And you corrupt those you're trying to help. No. <laughs> it is Allah and Allah alone who must enter into the market to distribute and redistribute wealth. One day for me, one day for you. كَيْ لَا يَكُونَ الدُّولَةَ بَيْنَ الْأَغْنِيَا إِمِنْكُمْ So that the rich do not remain permanently rich with wealth, circulate, with wealth circulating only amongst the wealthy. I hope I'm not becoming too difficult for you now. No, good, fine. Because you've got to go home and teach the subject, huh? Now then, Allah is the one who, when you do business, He can now intervene and cause some to make a profit and others to suffer a loss. Huh? But when you engage in a transaction that you call riba, it's not business. No. Why? Because you are seeking to avoid loss. Huh? Or to use more elegant language, you are immunizing yourself <laughs> from any possibility of loss. Hmm? So, I will lend you this money, you will return it to me with an additional amount. I don't have to bother whether the rain falls or the sun shines. No, I can go back home and have my biryani and go to sleep. My profit is assured. And in the event that you default, I want your pound of flesh, namely the mortgage, collateral. So that if you default and you cannot repay, I can seize your property. So that I <laughs> am immunized from loss. Hmm? So that's not business. It does not qualify as business. Having completed the process of education, so simply, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then moved to stage two. And this happened about the year three of the hijrah. La ta'akulu riba. A command. It's not haram. Ad'afa muda'afa. But the process of education continues after the command, the prohibition. It's haram. Don't do it. Here's one of the reasons why you should not do it. Because riba can be a rope around your neck. The rate of interest can cause the principal son to multiply several times over. And as it multiplies, you reach the stage where you are no longer capable of ever repaying the loan. Because the rope is getting tighter and tighter. So if you want to get some free labor and you're in South America, you've got all these American Indians out there, and you want a veneer of respectability that you're not enslaving them. So what you do is you offer to the American Indian a loan. You know how the banks go down on their knees and they beg you, please take a loan? You see that? <laughs> So the American Indians will take a loan from the European colonizer who, the, who now has his plantations and he needs labor plantations. And when the American Indian cannot repay the loan and substitute the American Indian with Bangladesh, you see what's happening. Then he now has to work on the plantation to repay the loan. And when he dies, his children have to take over. When they die, their children have to take over. 
called the Latifundia. I wish we had some from Venezuela here or some from Bolivia here in this gathering. Hmm? And so we were warned in just these few words, Ad'afa Muda'afa, that the rate of interest multiplies. So the rope can become tighter and tighter until eventually you are enslaved. This is precisely what has happened in the world. But when the revelation came down, the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, dazzling to behold. And only one man I know of was able to recognize that wisdom. It was a British sheikh who wrote a book on the subject, Merchant of Venice, hmm? Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> the Prophet <laughs> enforced the prohibition of money lending on interest from that day forward. But he did it only for new transactions and did not do it, I'm going to use a big word now, did not enforce it retroactively. So if the revelation came down Monday morning and you lent money on interest on Tuesday and the fellow refused to repay the money with interest and he goes to the court, the court will refuse to uphold the legality of the transaction. No, it's an invalid transaction. Haram. But if he lent the money last week and you refuse to pay, he can go to court. And the court would uphold the validity of the transaction because the prohibition of riba is not enforced retroactively. Why? Why? It's such a pity that they should say, that this stage of the process is now mansukh. <laughs> it is abrogated, it is cancelled, it is superseded by another stage. Hmm? The reason why he acted this way is because you want to win the battle in the economy. And if you want to win the battle in the economy, you have to have strategy. You have to be able to corner the moneylender. You have to be able to marginalize the moneylender. And you have to succeed in demonizing the moneylender before you pick up your sword. So when you pick up your sword, it's just for the finishing job. And this is the stage that we now have in Medina. And it continues from approximately the year three of the Hijra until the farewell pilgrimage. So people are asking, Allah has made it haram. No new river. So who are those who are still collecting? So now you can identify them. So and so and so and so and so and so are still collecting riba. Hmm? They don't like their names to be published in the newspapers, you know. When the bank has to repossess, <laughs> no, they don't want their names published. Looks bad. So the, you, you now admit of the possibility of ma targeting them because they're the only ones still collecting riba but no one else is allowed to. These are the professional money lenders. And then, you now have a process in the economy in which people are telling to the money lender, speaking to him, listen, how can you take and give nothing in return? Don't you have any sympathy for the people? Don't you have any human kindness? Don't you have any sense of justice? Hmm? This is what Shakespeare captured with absolute brilliance in Merchant of Venice. 
So please go back and read Merchant of Venice after having listened to this lecture. Mm -hmm. And as this process of demonization continues, and the appeal to the human compassion of the heart of the moneylender continues, <coughs> and social pressure is being brought to bear upon them, and even the children are feeling embarrassed. Daddy, you know what they're saying at school? Some of the moneylenders stop. They have the right to demand, but they say we voluntarily give it up. Hmm? So that over a period of time, more and more moneylenders will give up the riba. And only at the last moment, when Nabi Muhammad was addressing the people from Arafat, only then, in his wisdom, only then did he enforce the prohibition of riba retroactively. See the wisdom. Now, if you still refuse to give up the riba, riba, we're going to take up the sword against you. And we are beginning with the riba which is due to my uncle, Abbas. It's cancelled. Hmm? If Allah and his messenger are at war, then we are also at war. And so the very last revelation that came down in the Qur'an was a revelation which made it obligatory on the Ummah Muhammad to use force, military force, to ensure that riba does not again return to the economy. Because this poison if it is injected into the economy, would paralyze you and open the gates to slavery. This has been an examination or a review of the stage-by-stage -stage process of uh, dealing with the subject of riba in the Quran. Stage one, public education. Stage two, prohibition, but no retroactive enforcement. And in stage two, the process of a public relations process must be pursued vigorously to marginalize the money lender, to corner him to defeat him in the battle for public opinion. And then stage three, when he is cornered, the enforcement of the prohibition of riba retroactively. Now we come to ma nansakh min ayatin aw nunsiha na'ti bi khayr minha aw mithliha which surah? Masabu you had too much for breakfast this morning <laughs> surah al-Baqarah surah al-Baqarah I think there were 106 the overwhelming majority of our learned scholars apply abrogation internally in the Quran despite the fact that he who was sent who was appointed by Allah to teach the Quran the only one so appointed never told us of any verse of the Qur'an being abrogated or cancelled or forgotten. Yet the overwhelming majority of our scholars hold the view that, ab that abrogation is to be found internally in the Qur'an. And as a consequence they say that once you drink, we've got to beat you. 
Remember yesterday? Was it yesterday? Yes. <laughs> Once you drink, we're going to beat you. And therefore the stage-by-stage -stage process of dealing with the disease of alcoholism is no longer applicable. We got non-Muslims in the village, yeah? My next-door neighbor, the police officer, they're non-Muslims. All that we'll say to them is, keep the alcohol in the home. We're not going to prohibit them from having alcohol in their home. Just don't bring it out in the public, all right? Where they'll buy the alcohol is not my business. It's not going to be sold, in, of course, in the Muslim village. You crazy? <laughs> but if he goes to Cape Town and he buys his alcohol and he comes back to the village, I'm not going to stop him. He's not a Muslim. Hmm? And these people who are addicted to vodka, do you remember the Russians? We're not going to sell you the vodka, but if you need the vodka, you've got to find it. But remember, if someone is addicted to drugs, and you deny him access to drugs, then there's a stage which he can reach where he'll become a killer. He'll kill you. So be careful. All right? Well, you cannot buy your vodka in the village. But if you need the vodka, you could bring it with you. You could get it from outside. We're not going to prohibit you. Not in the Muslim village. So they say that this stage-by-stage -stage process is abrogated for alcohol. And so don't take the shahada, brother until you're cured, because once you take the shahada and you're in this village, we're going to beat you. So the poor fellows did not take the shahada. There were 12 of them? 12 of them. Uh-huh. And about a month later, you know what happened to the bus? And they all died. There you are. That's your system. But we said, take the shahada, brother. Take it right away. And then we had stage one. Public education. We took him to the hospital. We took him to the cemetery. And where did we take him again? <laughs> Police stations. <laughs> and a number of them gave it up through the appeal to the rational faculty. And then we embraced them with the love of the Brotherhood of Islam and the Masjid and Salat and Sun. And then we hit them. No Salat. Until you can understand what you're saying. A mother put her sons out of the house. It hit them. And so a, an internal power emerged now to complement the external power to break the chain. And then came the third stage. Now since we appeal to the external and we fail and we intern, appeal to the internal and we fail, now we're going to have to shame you. Huh? So if you drink, we're going to beat you. But not an act of brutality. A slipper, or we take off the shirt and roll it. And after we give him one or two beatings, that's it, no more. This is our way, because we did not apply abrogation internally in the Quran. Similarly with riba. In Pakistan, it was in the 1980s perhaps, the government, the parliament passed legislation that the prohibition of riba is going to be enforced from the 31st of July, so on, so on, so on, so on. So on that day, all riba stops. Do you believe that? Did they never hear what a man named Muhammad alayhi salat was saying? Did they never study of how he proceeded with the subject of prohibition of riba in Medina? I hope that this lecture were to reach to them, inshallah, somehow or the other. They did that because they consider the final revelation to have cancelled or abrogated previous revelations. Hmm? This is 
one part of the subject of riba, namely borrowing and lending money on interest, dealt with in the Quran. And we have explained, and we've done it, I believe, adequately, that this is a method through which the money lender remains permanently rich and constantly grows richer. And the implication of the rich remaining rich and growing permanently richer is that the poor will be imprisoned in permanent poverty and eventually reach the stage of destitution. We also explain that there is a second strategy at work. Remember the Oda'afa Muda'afa? The second strategy at work is that they lend you money on interest, calculating how much you can repay. So they have to know how much you have. They have to know how much resources you have <laughs> before they lend you money on interest. Because the reason why you're lending on interest to that man is because you want to trap him. What was the name of the book? Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Who wrote it? John Perkins. So you're not going to get that book and read it. Because that is Adafa Mudafa. But the Quran also spoke about something else. In the economy of the Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam that there was riba in that economy and Allah destroyed them and gave a command وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Bakhs is to make little وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودًا Do not Diminish. Do not diminish people's wealth, people's property, people's goods. The Prophet said, if you meet a man coming to the market, to sell his watermelons. You got watermelons in Simon's town? And you buy his goods from him before he can enter the market. And when he enters the market, he finds out that he could have gotten a better price in the market. That's riba. because you exploited his ignorance of the market price. To get a profit or a gain greater than that to which you are justly entitled. Hmm? That's the elegant way of saying it. The Americans say, you ripped him off. <laughs> This is one of the ways that the Bakhs takes place. Do not, do not diminish the value of people's labor, property, wealth. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to the Prophet والسلام, and offered him some dates. Since you've been listening to my lectures, you're familiar with this. And the Prophet والسلام, said, Bilal, these are fine quality dates. You should read some of the commentary on this lecture on the internet. We can't understand. Yeah. Read some of it on the internet. I sometimes get a chance to get away from my wife and get the computer and take a look at it. <laughs> she, she says that's his second wife. <laughs> 
These are fine quality dates. Bilal, where did you get them? O Messenger of Allah, I had two kilograms, two sa'as, so let's use kilograms, of inferior quality dates and I exchanged them for this one kilogram of superior quality dates. If the two kilograms of inferior quality dates were worth 25 re what you, your, your money is called? Rands. 25 rands each, okay? So the two kilograms would be worth 50 rands? 25 by 2 is 50? Is it? Yes. Right, good. So, the one kilogram of the superior quality dates is worth 50 rands. So in value, the transaction is the same in value. Bilal, this is riba, the essence of riba. You could imagine how Bilal must have been shaking. Bilal, what you should have done was to sell the two kilograms of inferior quality dates and take that money and buy the one kilogram of superior quality dates. But a direct exchange of dates for dates <coughs> which was unequal was haram, was riba. But Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu exchanged one camel for four camels. No riba, no haram. So the question that we ask is why was it riba for the dates and was not riba for the camels? I went into, let me not mention the name, a very famous Darul Ulum in this country. The principal of the Darul Ulum called the members of the staff and about 700 students and, and, and offered me a chance to address the entire Darul Ulum, which was very fine of him. And when I asked the question, nobody could answer. Nobody could answer. But a hundred years ago, a schoolboy, a hundred years ago, a schoolboy would have been able to answer that question. Which is one of the signs of the last day that knowledge will disappear. Hmm? Why was it haram for the dates, but not for the camels? The answer to that question is in another hadith. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, when a transaction involves an exchange of gold for gold, when a transaction involves an exchange of gold for gold, silver for silver, wheat for wheat, barley, for barley, dates for dates, salt for salt, it must be equal for equal, hand to hand, meaning a credit transaction is prohibited, prohibited, it must be equal for equal, hand to hand, otherwise it will be forever. I'm seeing some faces looking a little worried now. You have good tea ready for them? <laughs> it's really not so difficult. What is common to all these six? What is common to all these six? Answer. They were all used as money in the market in Medina. 
if gold and silver were in short supply, gold meaning the gold dinar, silver meaning the silver dirham, if gold and silver were in short supply in the market in Medina, they would use dates as money. Because dates were in abundant supply in the market in Medina. Number two, in all six of these, the value of the money, as Sheikh Ali Mustafa was mentioning with it this morning, in all six of these, the value of the money is inside the money. Yes. And so we say that the money has intrinsic value. Can you believe this? I think it was about 1995. And I heard with my own ears Dr. Muhammad Mahathir declaring, money has no intrinsic value. <laughs> I, I live long enough to see him eat his words. Money has no intrinsic value, he said. And Prime Minister of the country. Yeah? In all six of these, They were used as money. In all six of these, the value of the money was in the money. In all six of these, the value was created by Allah. Ab novo, from nothing. Only He and no one else but Him. You should tell this to Washington for me, please. Only he and none best for him is Badi Samawati Wallah. Khalik is he who creates. Fatir is he who creates from point of origin. And Badi is he who creates from nothing. From nothing. Ab novo as they say in, Spanish, in um, Latin. So in all six of these, number one, you have money, number two, you have intrinsic money, you have money whose value was created by Allah from nothing. That money, that value can fluctuate, of course it can, because he can produce, he can send more or he can withdraw and there will be less. If there is greater supply than demand, then the value would be less. And if there is greater demand than supply, the value would be more. A man came to the Prophet والسلام, and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Impose price control. The Prophet said, No. Now, we are accustomed when he says, no, that's it. But this companion of the Prophet was a very courageous man. I don't know where he got the courage from. He went back a second time after some time. Oh, Messenger of Allah, price is too high. Impose price control. Prophet said, no. And do you know what happened? You went back a third time. <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been really high. And again the Prophet said no. Because Islam gives to the world nothing more than this. Nothing more than this. A free and a fair market. Nothing more than this. There is no advantage for the Muslim over the non-Muslim, not in our market, no. If a non-Muslim offers goods for sale and you like the goods and the price is right and you buy from the non-Muslim and you did not buy from the Muslim, you have done absolutely nothing wrong. The day you start saying, I must buy from my Muslim brother, 
you are destroying the free market because the market does not discriminate between Muslims and non-Muslims. No. MashaAllah, what a beautiful religion. Scholars of international economics at the State University of Binghamton in upstate New York, who were the most advanced in thinking on the subject, came to the conclusion that the last free and fair market that the world experienced was the market of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Hmm? So the Prophet said no for the third time. But he said we can pray to Allah to bring down the prices by increasing the supply. Hmm? So value can fluctuate. Even the value of gold can fluctuate depending on demand and supply. But at no time does money have a value other than the value that Allah has given to it. So now we can answer the question. The reason why it was riba for the dates and not riba for the animals was because dates were used as money. And if I could give you one kilo and you give me two in return, you open the door for the money lender, isn't it? Come on, isn't it? Yeah. I give you this much, you give me that much in return, higher. So you open the door for the money lender. This is the essence of riba, he said. Once it is money on this side and the same money on this side, it must be equal to equal. The reason why it was okay for camels was because animals were never used as money. Hmm? I work for the whole month and I get my salary and my salary is a goat. You heard that one, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. So I'm taking the goat home and the goat fell down in the ditch and died and I reach home and I told my wife salary died. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she said, who tell the boss? I don't think she's here, is she? <laughs> I went to the boss and I told him, what salary time? He said, but when I give you salary, salary was a lie. <laughs> so animals can fall ill, animals can die, you can't use animals as money. As a consequence of which you can exchange one camel for four. Hmm? Equal for equal, hand to hand. Other than that, it would be riba. So if there is a transaction, particularly with the Islamic banker, if you have a transaction in which I am writing a check for you, because you know the bank never buys the house, eh? No, the bank never buys the house. That involves unnecessary legal fees and so on. So all the bank does is write out the check for you. And you go and buy the house. So if I have a transaction in which there is an exchange of money for money, and it's the same money, same money, Malaysian ringgits. I hope I'm not being unfair to Malaysia. <laughs> Money for money. I am giving you money and you are giving me money. The same money. It has to be on the spot. Cash. It cannot be credit. It will be riba. That's the implication of hand to hand. 
prohibited. It is prohibited to have a financial exchange of money for money, if it is the same money as a credit transaction. This point has come out for the first time in my public lectures. I never explained it before because I did not understand it before. So welcome to money <laughs> in Islam. Do you mind if I call it sunnah money? No. Good. But that's not all. This money is also in the Qur'an. Because the dinar is in the Qur'an and the dirham is in the Qur'an. What they did was to first send the armed forces to occupy and to colonize. And the process of colonization was not only to rip us off and to make London rich and New York rich, but more than that. The process of colonization was, among other things, for the purpose of taking our money out of the market and replacing it with something else. What they replaced it with was something, a, a monetary system that at the beginning could not be clearly understood. But then came 1944. What happened in 1944? Bretton Woods Conference. Mm -hmm. And out of the Bretton Woods Conference, what, what emerged? The International Monetary Fund. So at least from 1944, we have no excuse. What came out of the process of decolonization was a new monetary system in which money is no longer something with intrinsic value. Now, I should have mentioned and I forgot to mention that in these six, in these six, money is either precious metals or articles of food consumption. So you can't ban it, the government can't ban it. People need it to food, that's food, see? They could ban the gold. Articles of food consumption, which are in abundant supply in the market and which have a shelf life. As a consequence of which we say, well, if you are in the Indonesian island of Java and you want to bring back Sunda money and you have a shortage of gold and silver, what would you use as money? Rice. And if you were in Cuba and you got the news that Fidel Castro doesn't smoke cigars anymore and you want to bring back Sunda money and you do not have enough gold and silver, what would you use? Sugar. Sugar. Okay, and remember brown sugar is better than the white sugar. So, what they did was to take the, the good money out of the market in the process of decolonization, they first remove the real money out of the market and replaced it with this money which number one has no intrinsic value. None. Number two, they are creating wealth out of nothing out of nothing. And so they are playing God, hence shirk. The system started, however, with dust in our eyes. That at least one currency had integrity. Only one currency had integrity. And that was the U.S. dollar, because 
it was redeemable in gold at how much? Thirty-five. It was redeemable in gold at thirty-five dollars an ounce. But then after that, they reneged on their obligation and finally even that redeemability <coughs> was torn up. And number two, only governments could bring their dollars to redeem it for gold and not people. We came to the conclusion, therefore, that this entire monetary system was bogus, was fraudulent, was haram, and that it was used to rip us off. <coughs> that they could just print paper, print paper, and buy whatever they want from anywhere in the world, and we will ship all our resources to them of which the most important was oil. And all they had to do was print paper and ship it to us. What will Allah do? What will Allah do to an ummah which has so disgracefully, disgracefully abandoned the Quran and abandoned the Sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salatu insofar as money is concerned. This is a bitter hadith. It is seldom ever quoted. Seldom. It is narrated by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It is recorded in the Sunnah of Tirmizi. And the Prophet ﷺ prophesied, يُوشِكُ وَيَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ الزَّمَانِ لَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَى اسْمُ وَلَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ إِلَى رَسْمُ مَسَاجِدُهُ مَعَمِلَةٌ وَهِيَ خَرَابُ مِنَ الْغُدَى علماؤهم شر الناس ممن تحت أديم السماء من عندهم تخرج الفتنة وفيهم تعود It will not be long before that time will come when nothing will remain of Islam but the name and nothing will remain of the Quran but the traces of the writing the masajid at that time of those people would be grand structures, magnificent buildings, iron and steel, multi-million dollar buildings. And when you want to make wudu, you don't have to turn any tap. No, you some kind of a electrical beam and you just <laughs> abracadabra and water starts falling. <laughs> wow, this is marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> Grand structures but devoid of guidance. <laughs> the religious scholars of Islam, of those people, not all, not all, ulama <laughs> The religious scholars of Islam at that time and amongst those people would be the worst people beneath the sky. From them would come and they would be the centers of fitna, means to which people are tested and tried. When you fail, you're corrupted. What do we do? Number one, be careful. <coughs> I'm not going to borrow money and interest anymore. No, sir. Not a loan for college fees. Not to buy a house. 
not to buy a car, and not to take my wife on a trip to Disneyland. And also the people borrowing money and interest to perform the Hajj, you know that. <laughs> and the United States they do even better than that. In that glorious country from, called the United States from which people come, scholars come to teach us the Deen. They buy a building with a bank loan on interest. They designated a masjid. Yeah? And people start performing salat in the masjid. And they hold something called a fundraising dinner. <laughs> And they say, brothers, 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 the house of Allah is his river. Come on, come on. <laughs> so we're not going to do that. <laughs> but when they don't get you to the front door, they try to get you to the back door. So they create a curious thing called the Islamic Bank. And the Islamic Bank says, well, some of the transactions of the Islamic Bank are of course halal, but this is the window dressing, so to say, the dust in your eyes, because the major source of funding for the Islamic Bank is what is deceptive. <coughs> If I engage in a transaction with you in which both the buyer and the seller are aware of the profit margin, the cost price and the selling price, the difference between the two, and both in agreement on this transaction, it's called murabaha. It's a valid transaction, it's a halal transaction. Okay. So what the bank says is that you want to buy this house, and the cost of the house is 500,000 South African rands. And you don't have the 500,000 South African rands, so no problem. We will buy the house, which is the first lie. We will buy the house for 500,000. And we will sell it to you for 1 million. And since both buyer and seller are aware of the profit margin, and both buyer and seller are in agreement on the profit margin, it qualifies as Morabaha. So come on, here's a check for 500,000 and go buy the house. The first problem with this is that the bank cannot sell what it does not own. That's the first problem. So you must first buy the house and establish your legal ownership. You cannot sell an option. Not in Islam. So after you bought the house and established legal ownership, which involves a lot of fees, eh? only then you can sell. But the bank does not do that, obviously. So that's the first problem with the transaction. But there's a second problem with the transaction. And that is that the Prophet would buy goods and would not have the cash to pay for it. And the shopkeeper would allow him to take the goods and he'd pay later. So this is called a credit transaction where you pay later. But there is absolutely no evidence, not a shred of evidence, that the shopkeeper was allowed to increase over the cash price for the credit transaction. But the bank has increased the cash price to the credit transaction. For the credit transaction. The cash price was 500,000 and the credit price is 1 million. The difference between the two 500,000 rands must be explained. Money has increased over time. There is no other reason to justify the increase in price but time. 
that money should increase over time, that is riba. That is how Makkah practiced riba. Makkah was a commercial city. And you'd have one marketing agency for the city, okay? It's called the caravan. Rehlat al-shita'i was So the caravan would lead, would take goods from several people. Hmm? In order for you to put your goods into that caravan that Abu Sufyan is taking to Damascus, you need some you need some cash, you need some capital. So the money lender would lend money on the condition that you repay him with an additional amount. That was riba in Makkah. So the money lender realizes an increase of, of his money over a period of time. That was riba, riba and nasiya. This is what the bank is doing. So when you go to the bank, ask the banker, what's the cash price? And if he hears you were a student of Imran Hussein, he refused to answer you. <laughs> he, he, he will refuse to answer you. But oh, we don't deal in cash. You can then say to him, excuse me, sir, I don't want to be disrespectful. No. But um, the norm of a business transaction in Islam is always a cash transaction, sir. And a credit transaction is the exception to the norm. So if you're not offering you, offering people cash transactions, only credit transactions, sir. Uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. Salaamu Alaikum. <laughs> you must have a cash price if you want to have a valid transaction. And only after you establish a cash price, only then you can offer a transaction credit. But when you offer it as a credit transaction, you cannot have a higher price for credit over cash. If he offers you a credit transaction at a price higher than the cash price, atu burhanakum. Give me your dalil, give me your proof. And he says, mufti so and so and mufti so and so and mufti so and so. Say, no, no, no. I want Muhammad alayhi so if they don't get you to the front door, they get you to the back door. This is back door riba. What do we do now? You do what Fahri has done. Get out of it. If you have any bank loans and interest, if you have any credit, I'm not going to ask you. If you have any credit cards and so on, get out of it. If you have any student loans with interest, get out of it. Turn to Allah and make Toba, seek forgiveness. Ask Him kindly with tears in your heart, open a way for me, I want to get out of it. If you take money from me, Pakistan has borrowed money. And you now find yourself being strangled and it is sinful, you want to make Toba, what do you do? Can he can Pakistan unilaterally repudiate its external loans? No. Because Allah says in the Quran, Wa in tubtum falakum ru'usu amwalikum. If you turn away from riba, then you are entitled to the return of the capital sum. Hmm? So if Pakistan borrowed money, Pakistan can say we are not going to pay the riba. Do what you want. We are unilaterally, unilaterally repudiating any obligation to pay the interest. 
You can do that. But you have to repay the capital sum which is borrowed. You can, of course, say we will repay the capital sum according to our capacity to repay, which is what Alan Garcia did in Peru, yeah, about twenty years ago. He announced that we will repay our external debts based upon our capacity to repay. But you have to repay your capital sum. If you don't have the means at all, then there is something in Islam called bankruptcy. But if you want to claim bankruptcy, then look at what the Prophet did. A man came to the Prophet and they saw to Islam and said, O Messenger of Allah, my creditors are after me. They are after me. I can't repay them. Please help me. Tell them to do something about it. He called the creditors. He took hold of the man's property, all the property, and sold it. Left him with only the clothes on his back. And then distributed the sales amongst the creditors. And then wrote off the balance. So the man is now free. Religion cannot allow someone to remain indebted indefinitely. That's there in the Torah. It is there in the Torah that no debt can continue for a period longer than seven years. After seven years it has to be written off. Hmm? So you can apply for bankruptcy, but they know about it, so they're making the bankruptcy laws more and more difficult for you, because they don't want you to escape from slavery. Then the other option is to get out of their countries, get to a place where you can escape from their stranglehold. The other thing to do is, once you are out of it, to return to the Sundamai, gold and silver. If you can do it in the city, fine. I don't think you can succeed. They will seize all your money. <coughs> so I say return to the countryside and build micro-markets. And in the micro markets, you will have gold and silver as money. And if you have a shortage, then you lose articles of food consumption, which are in abundant supply and have a shelf life. Good. One last thing. In Islam, there is something called musharaka, partnership. If you want to buy a house, Long time, long ago, we would build a foundation first and then put up one room. And if you did not have money to put up windows and doors, you'd, they had rice bags made out of jute and you'd hang a rice bag for the window. And I saw it with my own eyes. And then you'd build a second room and a third room and so. And that's how you built a house. Nobody went and borrowed money to build a brand new house. Boy, you should see it. The tiles in the bathroom. <laughs> and you should see that custom built kitchen. That's what the wife wanted. <laughs> yeah? And uh, you buy this house, okay? and you commit yourself to pay for such a long period of time. Nobody did that. And then when we said to you, this is riba, you then said to us, this is darura. You need a house to live in. Now who wants to live in a hut, mud hut? You need a house to live in. So this is necessity. Did the, did the religion not say that if you don't have food, you could eat pork? Yeah? Darura? That's what they told me in New York. So I said, well, in that case, why are you filling your plate with the pork? 
Huh? Look at the big house. <coughs> you should be eating the minimum pork possible to stay alive, eh? But you're filling the plate with pork. And number two, when you're eating the pork, you should be detesting it. But you fellas are, no, no, in America, they say, they say you guys are licking your teeth, <laughs> licking your fingers. You love the pork. Is that the aura? <laughs> and number three, while you're eating the pork, you have to be searching for food. Oh Allah, where can I get food on your earth? So I can stop eating this pork. But no, 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 you signed an agreement to eat pork for 30 years. You're not going to bother to search for food. Is that the rule? If you want to get out of riba, you don't do these things. You return to the remote countryside and build a small hut that you can build within your capacity, your means. No rent. Rent is only a transitional period. I also rented when I was in New York because when you're renting, you're paying your landlord's riba for him. <laughs> Indirect riba. You build a small house and live debt free. And you bring back the gold, the dinar and silver dirham in the market and you'll be able to save yourself as much as you can for riba. But finally, remember, the Prophet ﷺ said that the time will come when you not find a single person in all of mankind who is not consuming riba. And whoever says that he is not consuming riba, verily the dust of riba would be upon him. Verily the vapor of riba would reach him. This is the Jal's most dangerous weapon of all, riba. And if we allow it to be injected into our system, the Jal will enslave us. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتبع علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين We have one hour I timed it eh? <laughs> We have one hour which is a sufficient amount of time for discussion and question and answer